So, again, we're going, uh, I'm, I'm just giving you this broad sweep only because I, I, I'm not, sometimes when I give this sweep, students get like a little an antsy, like we got to defend our honor and our dignity against these insults of the Muslims. I just, I just think, calm down for a second, okay? Just listen, listen to what I have to say, <laughs> right? So, but I, what I'm, because what, what I'm trying to emphasize is that from the Turkish point of view or from the Muslim point of view, once you get to like 1200, 1300, God is always on their side. They, they, from their point of view, they don't suffer significant losses. Yes, from our point of view, our Western point of view, you know, Poitiers is real significant. The Reconquista is significant. Lepanto means something. But from their point of view, they could take these losses in stride. Mm -hmm. Because these, these, this, is the, these are the, this is the outpost for them. This is, this is Delaware, right? This is, I mean, this is Afghanistan for us, right? In other words, it's not significant from the standpoint of like the heart of their empire. It's not important. So what happens beginning in 1200, 1300, 1400, is that in the West, you start to get a lot of developments. Especially, well, especially after the Reformation, right? You get the, you get the rise, you get, a lot of promote, you get a lot of developments in medicine, in science, technology. It doesn't matter where it comes from, as far as I'm concerned. The point is just that. The point is this. You know, by 14, by the 14, by 1500, they have Constantinople. They're making inroads into Central Europe. Uh, <clears throat> by the time you get to the like 1750 or so, there's 120 nations from the Atlantic to the Pacific that are part of the Ottoman Empire. But from 1500 to 1750. Since they have this attitude towards the Europeans, that the Europeans are Franks, nothing good can come out of Europe, they're, they're uncivilized. But the people who are kind of in, these, this is, the people who are kind of in charge of Constantinople, who are descendants of the Turks, they themselves are kind of running on, they're running on fumes. The empire is running on fumes. Fumes from past civilizations. And they don't, they don't incorporate, and, and the Europeans by far surpass them by the 1750s in military technology, in scientific technology, in, in how to fight battles, in naval technology. And uh, so what happens is, <clears throat> beginning in the 1790s, the British especially, but also the French, and to some degree the Russians, the British start realizing, you know, uh, there's a lot of weaknesses in the Ottoman Empire. And, you know, they're, they're starting to get interested in India. They're starting to get interested in different places in, Latin, in, in the Middle East, uh, in Iran. The Russians start to realize the Ottoman Empire could start losing nations. There are some nations, especially in Central Asia, that have orthodox in them and the Russians are starting to think you know well maybe we could go to those nations kick the Ottomans out and start protecting our people and get some more land too which isn't bad <laughs> right <clears throat> Napoleon at one point in his escapades to try to rise and be the emperor he invades Egypt mm -hmm. right this competition starts in the Middle East and in North Africa between the French and the British over controlling various nations mm -hmm. So, the, the Muslim, the Ottoman Empire, beginning in the 1790s, starts to lose nations within their empire to the Franks. The Franks. Right? But wasn't it, when we, think, when we say empire, though, wasn't, I, I thought it was much less uh, cohesive. You no, know, there, were, there were internal fights. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was like any empire. There's internal fights. There's provinces trying to break off. The Iranians are... I mean, the Iranians convert the entire country in the 1500s. They convert the entire country to Shia Islam mm -hmm. over a 150-year period. So as to be kind of a... To go against a little bit uh, the Ottomans. Because they think the Ottoman rule is too harsh. Right? So, yeah, I mean, there's... 
there's there's um, there's disagreements, there's fights, as in all political bodies. But more or less, the Ottomans have kind of a they kind of have rule. They have empiric rule over all these nations as provinces. So I'm just, I'm just like this is their point of view. <clears throat> by the time you get to 1850, by the time you get to 1850, a, a good a, a good chunk of those nations are now under some sort of colonial rule. This is the rise of colonialism, mostly British, but also French and Russian. And it's it's precisely in the 1840s and 1850s you see the first radical Muslim. A guy named Jamal. In the 1840s? 1840s and 50s. A real, and he's also a really mysterious character. His name is Jamal al-Afghani. Mm. <clears throat> and he's born, he's born somewhere in like the hinterland between Iran and Pakistan and India. As a young man, he, he ends up at some point in Moscow. Mm. And then he ends up in London, and somehow in London he gets radicalized, and he returns to the Muslim world, I think Egypt and then Iran, and but then when he goes to the Muslim world, he never like stays in any one country too long. And everywhere he goes, he starts to promote radical Islam. Sounds like, like CIA no, he would be an MI6 plant. MI6. <laughs> There's no CIA at that point. No, but I mean, I think one... One theory is that he that he was that he was working for the gover- for one of these governments as like a double agent, and that they had reason to start radical Islam because that gives them an excuse to go in and, and pacify the population, right? But that's a very Machiavellian tactic. But that's the science of Machiavellian politics, right? And it's just science, so it's not immoral. It's just what it's what the <laughs> science. No, from their standpoint, it's like it's like you know it's like a. A libertarian making profits. It's not immoral. There's nothing you can do that's immoral. It's just what's required to make profit. Right? Pardon? It's Machiavellianism. It's Machiavellianism. I mean, I, I would say it is immoral, right? The object of the action is unjust in both cases. But they would say that's just what the science requires. And actually, there's this really, there's this one, uh, what's his name now? It's Daniel. He's a, he was a former Harvard professor. He wrote a book on Islam in the early 1980s. And the first, the first like 50 pages of the book, are, I think, are useful. I think the rest of the book is trash. But I think like the first... Because you know, he kind of gives this useful history. And this guy's a Jewish professor, and I forget his name. But he makes a great... I think he makes a very prescient comparison between Judaism and Islam. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's, uh, Remy Bragg, in his book... Remy Bragg is this French political philosopher... who has a book called, I think it's called The Rule of Law, comparing Islam, Judaism, and Christianity on, on law, on the, na- on the nature of law. And Bragg and this professor from Harvard, whose name I forget, they both make the same point. They say, in a way, Islam and Judaism are much closer to each other than either of them really is to Christianity. Mm-hmm. From the standpoint that <clears throat> they're both really governed by a law, Right? And that law comes out of scripture. In the case of Judaism, it's, it's scripture as interpreted by the Talmud, right? which is a complicated document. But, uh, but, then, but that, that, that scripture plus that interpretation of it is what creates the culture. And what this Harvard professor points out is that if you look at Judaism in Europe, uh, the Jewish people by 1648... There's, a, there's like 90% of the Jewish people in the world are in Poland. And they call Poland the paradise of the Jews. And the reason they call it the paradise, they themselves call it this. And the reason they call paradise the Poland, Poland the paradise of the Jews is because Poland basically says, we'll allow, whatever, your, your law, whatever, the, whatever they called the law at that time, which I forget the precise term. But they say, your law, you can live it in wherever, wherever you guys have your neighborhoods and your cities, your ghettos, you can live your law. And like the Jews are like super happy with that because they can fully live their law in their neighborhoods. <clears throat> and 
So they call Poland the paradise of the Jews. Now, in, 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 in 1640s, there's a Jewish messiah, a guy named Shabbatai Zevi. Uh, right? And Shabbatai Zevi, <clears throat> he starts going through the, the, get the neighborhoods saying he's the messiah. Huh. Right? And to prove he's the messiah, he's going to go to Constantinople. He's going to convert the caliph to Judaism. And then together, they're going to establish a universal kingdom of justice and peace. What is, what is how do you spell his name? Zevi, Z E V I. <coughs> Shabbatai. Shabbatai Zevi. S A B B A T A I. So he goes to Constantinople. <clears throat> he gets a he gets a he gets an audience with the caliph. He he gives the caliph his proposal. The caliph says, "I have a counter proposal. I'm going to tie you to that post there <laughs> and have my archers plug you with arrows." <laughs> <laughs> <Very rational. laughs> or you can convert to Islam. <laughs> oh. and, I'll, and I'll make you the governor of the province of Palestine. <laughs> so at that point, at that point, Shabbatai chooses conversion. No. Yes, 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 yes. You're joking. I'm not joking. So much I am not joking. The Jewish Messiah converts to Islam. Yeah, 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 yeah. At that point. 1648. Jewish Messiah... So at this point, at this point, this is this is the beginning of kind of a of a huge debate that starts within Judaism, <clears throat> and the huge debate the huge debate that starts within Judaism, should we, you know, God is basically like the idea is God is clearly not on our side. We're doing something wrong, right? Who's saying this? The the Jewish the Jewish elites, right? God is not on our side. We're doing something wrong. And so they start to break up into factions. One faction starts to argue, we got to for, forget about the law. We got we to gotta downplay the law. We got to turn Judaism into some sort of a nebulous faith. <clears throat> but make it a nebulous faith that can embrace <coughs> everything that's going on in Europe right now. The Enlightenment. Fully embrace the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Right? So make it a faith that's compatible with the Enlightenment. Which means we got to kind of like start, we got to start interpreting away a lot of these laws that are keeping us in the ghetto. And other, other factions will start, so this, this begins a 300 year process. I, I'm sorry I forget this Harvard professor's name, but I think it's a great summary. Because he says it begins a 300 year process that really only gets resolved after the Second World War. In this process, you see all sorts of different understandings of faith and reason that get themselves played out within Judaism. There are some people that argue, no, the problem is we, 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 we settled for these ghettos. What we gotta do is we gotta find some country, we gotta use terrorist tactics, in other words, they become kind of radical for implementing the law, right? We gotta find some comp country, we gotta use terrorist tactics, we gotta kick the people out, and we gotta have a country that's our country where we can fully implement the law and then once we fully implement the law, God will be on our side. No matter how grotesque or barbaric the law seems to other nations. Because why? This is the law that God gave us. And we've, we've been losers for 1,500 years, 1,600 years, because we haven't really ever faithfully lived the law. Right? So there's one faction that develops, which is a fundamentalist faction, committed to terrorism, to establishing states where they can implement the Jewish law. The, the other extreme is a faction of just, we got to basically interpret the law away and turn Judaism into some sort of this like faith for the family. When does this happen? This, is this, this debate, these debates begin in 1648. But I thought they were in like Jewish paradise in Poland in 1648. Well, that, that's, that's, when, that's after Shev. So, yeah, this is, this is the beginning of the change. Why do, why do things change because of Zemi? Because he, they became so, the Jewish community became so inflamed with hope oh. that he was the Messiah, that when it failed, there was a rash of conversions to Christianity. Do the records really show that it's like there were a lot of people who believed him? Yeah. Yeah. Just thinking about Wikipedia. It's just <clears throat> Even Wikipedia admits it. Like See, so he, was he Polish, and was he mainly roused the Polish Jews? Well, he was. 
I don't know exactly where he's from. But Hebrew. 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 Yeah. No, that's a different guy. No, I don't know who that is. But anyway, so he, um, so this debate. So after Shabbatai Zevi's failure, this is when these real serious debates start to appear within Judaism, and you'll see people rise up. You'll see people rise up in intellectual history, like Moses Mendelssohn, mm-hmm. who like is a complete yeah. fanatic of the Enlightenment, right? So these people start to rise up who basically, like, they're the, they're the promoters of the side of, let's just fully embla- embrace, like, what's the cutting edge of enlightenment in Europe and just make our religion compatible with that. And then there's other groups, between these two extremes, there's other groups that try to say, well, maybe we can kind of come up with some sort of modus vivendi or understanding of faith and reason that's somewhere in between. And essentially, I think, what this fellow at Harvard whose name I forget, <laughs> what he argues is that by, by the end of the Second World War, so 300 years later, the side of completely embrace modernity or the Enlightenment and have Judaism be some sort of a faith, kind of a, a family faith type thing, that's the side that wins out. That, that's the faction that kind of wins the debate. And so that's why, like in the United States, most of the Jewish people you'll meet they're kind of from that kind of faction of just embracing prog- whatever is progressive and most modern, right? <clears throat> and so that's why, you know, like when, when Obamacare was passed and the Catholic bishops tried to appeal for the uh, exemption for, for birth control. Let's do that, right? Yeah, so 34 of the 36 Jewish organizations in, uh, in Washington, D.C. went against the Catholics explicitly. Appealing, appealing basically to not let the birth control exemption go through. Mm-hmm. Right? Because why? Because they've just embraced progressive politics. <clears throat> and they wanted to show their full support of the Obama, Obama's efforts. So, but then what this fellow points out is that the crisis that Judaism entered in the 1640s, 1650s, Islam enters into the exact same crisis in the 1850s. Right? And this is where you can start to see the rise of fundamentalist Islam. And one of the first radical fundamentalists is this guy, this mysterious guy, whose last stop before he came to the Middle East was London, Jamal al-Afghani. And basically, what Islam starts to break up also into these same factions. The fundamentalist faction is the faction that argues, you know, the real problem the reason we're losing all these nations from the, from the empire, from the caliphate, is that we never faithfully applied in a kind of strict way the punishment, the, the rules and the punishments that are laid out in the Quran. So what we got to do is we got to use terrorist tactics, take our nations back from the Franks who have taken them over, and then, and then, and then we've, learned, we've learned our lesson. We've got to fully implement a kind of strict interpretation of the law. But then there's, there's, there's lots of other factions that break out within Islam. There's a kind of, there's a kind of, a, there's the same thing within Judaism. There's kind of an enlightenment faction that breaks out. And the enlightenment faction says, you know what we've got to do? The Quran is really brutal. We've got to kind of interpret the Quran in such a way you know, that these brutal parts are mystical or spiritual, and we, just, we should just turn Islam into like a family religion, you know, good family morals, and embrace enlightenment, embrace enlightenment thought. Do these fundamentalists, uh, how do they react to this kind of enlightenment faction? Well, so in other words, they, 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 they have real disagreements <coughs> with each other, too. Same things happen within Judaism. No, but I mean... There's like bitter disagreements between them. But with Islam, do they like kill each other off? Well, what I think what happens is in the by the time by the time you get to the no by the time you get to the no but then there's all sorts of factions in between too that say say well no well actually you can moderate some sort of faith and reason in Islam there's this medieval tradition if you go back to the medievals of trying to to understand faith and reason together Al Farabi Avicenna Averroes Al Ghazali not so much but he had his days you know yeah. <clears throat> so. So they start to have, they start to, um, 
there, there's all sorts of intermediate. There's it's not these two extremes are the only extremes. There's all sorts of in between. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I mean, I think you can see that. Uh, well, just be, before I answer your question, by 1920. So by 1920, 116 of the former nations of the Caliphate are now officially colonies of either the British, the French, or the Russians. Most, no, most of the British. <coughs> there are four free Islamic nations. Saudi Arabia, which is controlled by, economically by the British. Yemen, which is controlled economically by the British. Turkey, and I think, what's the fourth one? Lebanon? No. I think the fourth one was uh, Qatar or something like that. Ooh. Or Egypt, Egypt. The fourth one is Egypt, which is con controlled either by the French or the British, depending on how you look at it. Right? So <clears throat> this is complete, I mean, from, from the Islamic standpoint, or from the standpoint of any religion where if you have victory, God is on your side, this is a complete sign that God is mad at you. God is, Allah, Allah is angry. And you've got to figure out why he's angry. Right? So by the, uh, I would say in many, in many, in many, as these colonies start to get their freedom, in many of these colonies, what replaces the colonial masters are, are, are rulers who are generals, who are more or less on the side of doing what the Jews do, create a kind of enlightenment faith, Islamic faith, and just live that. We saw in, uh, in Turkey, you get Ataturk, right? In, in Egypt, you get, I forget the guy's name in Egypt, but uh, if you, we, in Iran, you get the family of the Pahlavi family, which is exactly this way in the 1920s. So I think the first round you could say the first hunt in the first between 1850 and 1980 or so, the first round is won by the secularists, at least as far as who's ruling in various countries. And but now you're seeing a kind of, I mean, you're seeing some, you're seeing some sort of reaction from the from the more fundamentalist types. Now, whether that's being funded by the British or the CIA or the whoever, well, that's another question, right? And they 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 clearly don't like each other. <laughs> right? What do you think? They clearly don't like each other. <laughs> but. <laughs> well, I mean, Osama bin Laden, there's a picture of Osama bin Laden in the White House in the 1980s. Right? There you go. He was clearly. No, we clearly, we clearly funded. We clearly funded the Taliban in the 80s. To fight the Russians. To fight the Russians. That's a clear black operation. <laughs> I mean, that's a clear black operation. That's like the and, and it's, yeah. fair, it's fairly well documented that yeah. you go back to the 1920s, the British MI6 are right there at the foundation of the, uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. I mean, that they, that they were founding, the British were, the British are famous for, as they're pulling out of their colonies, starting these radical groups that will keep pressure on the new, on the new free government so that the new free government will, will, will remain reliant on the British. Right? I mean, and also, I mean, I, at least in Israel, the, the friends I have who are in Israel, they all say the same thing, that the Israelis started Hamas. Uh, <clears throat> that's controversial with Israelis. Right. The Mossad started the Hamas. <laughs> My friends who are Israel, they're Israeli citizens, they're in Israel, they all tell me the same thing. Word on the street is, the Mossad started the Hamas. What's their incentive? <clears throat> because if you control the radicals, you can, you can lead them to break up the Palestinians into further factions. You can lead them to do stupid things to justify your incursions. Yeah, well, that happens a lot. And the media pretends like nothing to begin with. <laughs> right. Israel's like, what, what are we right. doing this for? If it's so, true, your thesis is true. So, so in a way, in a, in a way... <laughs> You know. <laughs> There's this great book called. Uh, no, that's a great book too. But 
There's this other great book on the British role in Saudi Arabia and Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood. And it's actually a scholarly book, but I forget the name of it now. I'll think about it. I'll let you know. Looming Tower. I love this book. What's that? I, I, I never read that one. It's just the build-up. Of- I think the I think the book written by this British scholar is called Secret Agent or Secret <coughs> Affairs. Secret Affairs, I think, is the name of the book. And this guy, this guy's like a Marxist. He's been, he's like the, the typical Marxist thing. He spent like ten years in the archives reading diplomatic files. You know, yeah. only, only a, like a dedicated, truly dedicated scholar would do something like that, <laughs> right? So I think it's called Secret Affairs. Is the name of the book. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, so the point being, the point being that, oh, just one more thing. For example, the, 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 the intellectual heart of Shia Islam is Qam, Qam, Iran. It's, it's one of the places where one of the, Qam is where one of the, uh, you know, Shia has 12 imams, the 12 legitimate successors of, of Mohammed, the, the, the split in, between Shia and Sunni originally, the kind of the, one of the major sticking points, is who was the, the legitimate successor of Muhammad. The split between who and who? The Shia and the Sunni. Right? Who's the legitimate successor of Muhammad? Okay. And basically, apparently Muhammad before he dies, that's it. That's the book, Mark Curtis. Yeah. But apparently Muhammad before he dies, he says Ali should be my successor. But he says it orally. Okay? But for, for them, I mean, for, for Muslims, the sayings of Muhammad are also part of revelation. Right? The hadith. It's what you, what you take seriously. Okay? So he says, Ali should be my successor. Is that his cousin, Matthew? It's the son of Fatima. Okay. <clears throat> so he... While Ali and his family are at Muhammad's funeral, I think it's Umayyad, who was the successful general, he gets himself crowned as the successor of Muhammad. Right? And so that, that's the beginning of the split. Because Umayyad says, look, God is on my side. I'm the general winning all the battles. <laughs> I should be the successor of Muhammad. And Ali says, no, there's this hadith, and, and the Shia say, no, Ali is the successor of Muhammad. Were the Umayyads in Spain? Eventually, yeah. yeah. It, it, might, it might be Omar, Omar, I forget exactly who it is. Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr. Right? But basically, so this begins the divide. And so for the Shia, the, there's 12 Imams who are the legitimate descendants of, Moh- of Muhammad, of Ali, and they're the legitimate rulers of Islam. And then the 12th Imam... He goes into occultation. When he's born, when he's three years old, he goes into minor occultation and hiding, right? He goes into minor occultation, and then he comes out like 33 years later, 34 years later. He stays out of occultation for like three or four years, and then he goes into major occultation. And he's going to be in major occultation until the end of time. This is the Mahdi. So he's in hiding until the end of time. And then when he's going to come back and Jesus is going to pray with him, right? Right. And then when he comes back, he and Jesus are going to pray together. Yeah. And that will bring about the end of the world. <clears throat> so, and then that's, this, that's the origin of Shia Islam. And the Shia throughout their history tend to be a little bit more like the Catholics. And the Sunnis tend to be a little bit more like the Protestants. As far as approach to scripture. <laughs> And also even organization. Yeah, and their cultures. And culture, yeah. So most of the Islamic philosophers actually come out of Shia Islam. Right? Inclu- including the last one, Suwahardi, this last Platonist. Al-Farabi, he was a Shia. So the Mongols converted to Sunni Islam? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> it kind of it makes them both like better allies and also more fighting enemies. Than yeah. Shia. Yeah, so... What, what, and I think also, especially in the last two centuries, like the country that has the biggest delegation to the Vatican is Iran. Mm-hmm. And I, I, my personal view, having studied this for a couple of years, 
<laughs> is that no, they, they watch very closely and they study very closely everything the Catholic Church does. And they try to find ways to imitate it. But very discreetly, like extremely discreetly. So you can see in the last 200 years, they've developed this whole system of becoming a religious scholar, and they have different names for the religious scholars, culminating in Ayatollah. And then even from this, the Ayatollahs, there's even a further distinction that you can make all the way up to now supreme leader. Right? So you can see them developing a kind of hierarchy mm -hmm. because they see in the Catholic Church hierarchy makes sense. Mm. Right? Now, the, now the status for developing it is much different than obviously because they don't have sacraments. Right? But you can see them doing it. Also, we began our Thomistic revival in the, in the 1870s with Leo XIII. So after they had this constitutional revolution in Iran in 1906, which failed, it was kind of it was kind of an enlightenment it was kind of an enlightenment revolution. Uh, the, the leaders of it were like your typical Europeans in the sense of a little bit skeptical about religion, not so what, not so sure what to do with the imams and the ayatollahs and all those kind of people. But they they worked out some compromises, but then it failed. But then the, the Ayatollahs, after the failure of this revolution, said we need to revitalize uh, classical Islam. And so they, they, they initiated their own medieval revival. And they, they set up Qam as the center of that revival. And the idea would be is that they would go back, they would go back and study Al-Farabi, the great medieval commentators, the great medieval thinkers, and they would try to come up with like a new synthesis of faith and reason within, it, within Shia Islam itself. And uh, actually, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was the leader of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, he, uh, he studied at Quam in the 1920s. That's where, he, that's where he kind of came of age, QOM. And typically, at least all my friends who are, all my friends who are scholars that got invited to Iran this is the place. They're, they're always taken to Quam for dialogue, and there's philosophers there. There's this one guy who got his PhD, I think, at Notre Dame, and then, sad, sad to say, he converted to Islam. <clears throat> and he became a philosopher in Quam. His name is Mohammed Legenhausen. Legenhausen. <laughs> <laughs> Mohammed, Le he's like a German from New York, right? But just with scandal, I think, I think he was scandalized by all the craziness in the 70s and 80s. And so that scandal just drove him to, he, like, at least these people are, I think he thought they were at least consistent. I mean, I'm not saying. Question. Um, so Shia Islam is countries, is ordinarily countries like Iraq and Iran. Yeah, so Iraq is probably, Iraq is probably like 70% Shia. Mm -hmm. Iran. Iran is 90% Shia. And then I think there's one country, there, also in, in Western, on the Arabian Peninsula, there's a lot of Shia on the Western part of the peninsula. Like no, not in Saudi Arabia itself, but in those, in those, little, those little oil states that Britain formed. Yemen. Like, like, like Yemen and uh, Arab Emirates and Qatar, and, right? And then there's Shia also in Lebanon, what's now Lebanon, Damascus, uh, Syria, and... Uh, some in Jordan as well. And then there's a few in Pakistan, and there's a few sprinkled on every country. And Al-Qaeda is but that? Al-Qaeda is radical Sunni. Okay. And ISIS is radical Sunni. And Taliban is Sunni. Taliban is Sunni. Pardon? Taliban is Sunni. Taliban is Sunni also. They're all against the Iranians. They hate, they hate the Shia more than they hate the Iranians. Right. Has Hezbollah is, is Shia. Hezbollah in Lebanon is Shia. And all the, the Palestinians. Palestinians tend to be Sunni, but, but the Iranians support them because a lot of the Sunni countries don't. So part of my point of bringing up this comparison is also to point out that you know, Israel, Judaism entered in this crisis in 1648. It took them 300 years to come out of it, to come to some sort of resolution, Right? So Islam entered in this crisis in the 1850s. So we're not even 200 years into the crisis at this point. Right? <clears throat> so I think it's premature to kind of say, well, there, there's a definitive... I mean, obviously, the best thing would be that Our Lady of Fatima happens and uh, 
the Russians reunite with Rome, and then they lead the conversion of the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. And most likely the first place they would convert would be the Iranians. Because, because, there's, because of the historic ties between Russia and Iran. Yes? Would you say that the Jews even figured it out? I mean, you have, they created a state of Israel. Yeah, but I think you can say, like, I think you can say the Jewish population among the elites. Okay, they want the elites. I mean, you can say, I mean, look, Jews in the United States are like 90% yeah. embrace, the embrace, embrace the radical enlightenment. <laughs> and your religion is basically just uh, like kind of a cultural a family true? family religion. <clears throat> even the foundation of Israel is even Israel is not as I mean Israel is a problematic state from even from this standpoint because you go to the foundation of Israel, the foundation of Israel was like a third Marxist, a third just secularized Jews. <clears throat> And a third of all sorts of other different factions, and so like the the, the a lot of these a lot of the uh, Orthodox Jews, they're just like factions. They're like five percent of the population of Israel, okay. right? And I mean Netanyahu, I don't even think he practices. I mean he's a cultural Jew, but his party is like a rightist, secularist, Enlightenment party, right? So yeah, I mean they're arguing for their state. But it's kind of a bizarre... It's a marriage of convenience. You put the crazy yeah. Orthodox yeah. into the settlements. Right. So they agitate and go... And they had... And they... Populate. Yeah. They have 20 kids. And right. it's like, you know, you say, well, these crazy people, what are we going to do? I mean, they're Jews. We've got to kind of protect them. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, that, no, that is... <laughs> no, it's, it's a complete... <laughs> well, they're going to cause the end of the world when they... Don't Pardon? They're going to cause the end of the world when they remove the Dome of the Rock, so... Well, that, yeah, that's the, that's the Christian evangelical support of the Jews, yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. <clears throat> no, it has, yeah, you're right. Wow. Completely. That's a, whole, that's a whole other trajectory. It goes back to the 70s. But, uh, but I, so I would say that, I would say that the, um, the state of Israel is a, it's an aspect of it, but, but I think from the cultural standpoint, even in Israel, the majority have embraced the Enlightenment in mm. some form of it, okay. as far as the religion. I have a friend that grew up in a kibbutz. Really? Yeah, it's actually a great, it's fun, kind of a funny story because his parents were like completely dedicated Marxists. So, uh, when, these Jewish communists? so yeah, basically a kibbutz, well, a kibbutz is different, is di something different now than it was when he was growing up. So, about, again, about a third of the people that settled in Israel once became a state were communists. And so, because they, they thought they could potentially turn Israel into the communist paradise. So, what they, they set up these kibbutzes. And so, in the kibbutz, they tried to have perfect communism. So, the women would have the children, and the children were raised by, by workers. And the, the, the parents didn't know who their children were. Right? Because you can't have families. In perfect communism, you can't have families. So, <clears throat> what was ha what happened in my friend's kibbutz is that, for a while, they're all like they're all good communists. They have their workers raising the kids. The kids are going to kibbutz. They're living in the kibbutz place for kids with the nurses and whatnot, and then the teachers. And then at some point, the mothers they come to the kibbutz council. And they basically say to the kibbutz council, they make a petition saying, we're good kibbutzers, we're good communists, we believe in everything that's being taught here, <clears throat> but could we just maybe know who our children are? <laughs> just, to, just so we could watch them, watch their development. And, and so not to deal with them at all, but just like, you know, I know that that's my Johnny. That's my right? <clears throat> so they had this like huge debate about it. And... However the arguments went, the, the, the kibbutz council decided, okay, every mother can know who her child is. <clears throat> and so this, this goes on for like a year or so, and then the mothers come back with another petition. And then the second petition is like, we're good kibbutzers, we believe in everything, we love your principles, and, you know, down with capitalism. But could we maybe just like come to the orphanage little place, the husband and, 
No, could the, could the man and the woman who are the parents, could they come to the little orphanage place once a week and just have like one meal with the kids who are their kids? And so they have this huge debate, and then again, they, they, they concede. Right? So this happened like five more times. <laughs> right? And each step was a little bit more to where finally my buddy, when he was 11 years old, he moved in with his parents. And he went every day to the kibbutz school. And then went home, just like a normal kid. There you right? go. <laughs> so it's just a great, it's a great example. Wins. Even this... Uh, even this you know, it's funny, there's this, there was this one radical anarchist of the 1900s in France, P.J. Proudhon, and he, he's the one that came, he's the one that popularized this expression, property is threat, all, all property is theft. Yeah, so, and of course the anarchists in those days, they were against any social institutions. The goal was to eliminate all social institutions. Proudhon also had another pithy phrase. He said, really, in the end, behind every political question, he's, no, no, sorry, God is lurking behind every political question. Right, he, 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 and he was obsessed. He himself was obsessed with God. Even though he, no, because he, he was convinced. And I, I, think, I think he understood it, in a, maybe in the Jesus. wrong way. No, but I think he understood it the right way. That he, I mean, he was like anti-God, but he, but, but he, realized, he realized that every political question was a mask, really, of a religious question. And so he was always asking the God question for that reason. <clears throat> and, uh, but at the end of his life, he had a kind of intellectual conversion in the sense that he, real, he wrote a treatise in which he basically argued, I'm, I'm a good anarchist, I believe in anarchy. Property is still theft. But we need the authority of the church. And we need the authority of the family. Those two corporate bodies we absolutely need. Right? And I think he inspired a little bit. At least someone... I was never able to follow up on this project. I almost proposed this as my dissertation. And I probably should have. I probably would have been much... I probably would have attained much more fame and glory <laughs> than, uh, than I did. Because everyone thought it would be great like, to, to come out of Notre Dame writing about P.J. Proudhon. But like, why, why P.J. Proudhon embraced the family and, mm-hmm. and the church at the end? And the controversy that, called among, that caused among anarchists in the 19th century. It would be more of a historical question. Right? You could just say, well, this is the history right, of how the anarchists turned, turned on, on each other. And, it wouldn't be so. Uh, it would be cool because it's anarchy, you know. Anarchy, anarchy is always cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, so even even Proudhon recognized, right, that the family and that uh, the family and the and the church as authoritative institutions were significant. This also inspired, by the way, Yves Simon. Proudhon also inspired Yves Simon on this point to write his book about authority. His book, The General Theory of Authority. 